I bring you greetings once again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in whose name we have gathered together as God's people in this place in the presence of God to worship Him, to fellowship with one another and to meditate of His Holy Word. I want to really thank God for the privilege that has been mine during this uh, weekend for the last four days to bring God's Word to you. I want to express my gratitude for the organizers of the program, the leaders and the pastor of this congregation for extending this invitation. God willing, uh, tomorrow morning I would be going over to Chicago and we would have the weekend meetings there in that city uh, in the Assemblies of God Church there, pastored by Pastor George Stephenson. So that would bring um, the meetings to a close on Sunday and God willing I'd be leaving back uh, to India on Monday. Uh, normally, when I come to States, it's uh, the maximum two weeks. I take two weekend meetings because my hands are pretty full in India. I distribute my time uh, mainly for uh, various other organizations. Uh, many of you know how in the year 1971, the Lord enabled me to found uh, an organization in India called Blessing Youth Mission, which started as a campus ministry, but God in His sovereign grace he made it into a missionary organization and now it is working in 14 states of India with over 325 full-time missionaries. I had the privilege of founding it and leading it for 35 years and then in the year 2003 when I was supposed to retire when you become 58 as per the norm of the organization uh, even though I was a founder I wanted to keep myself in the discipline of any other full-time paid staff over there so I handed over the responsibility to the second liners. In fact, for the last 10 years, I was preparing that uh, group of uh, second liners. So the, the handing over was a very slow process. And now a new uh, team of leaders has taken over the administration of the organization. So I'm available to that organization as the chief advisor without any administrative and official responsibility. So I just keep myself open and available to various ministries, especially I spend time with the uh, missionaries and preachers and teachers and pastors of various organizations because whatever, by the grace of God, I have learned over the years, some of the lessons the hard way, I thought it is my obligation and responsibility to share them with the younger generation of leaders and the next generation of pastors and preachers. So that takes me to various places. I give just about uh, two programs every year for Tamil Nadu, where I come from. I'm basically Tamilian. And the remaining time, <clears throat> I try to distribute to non-Tamil states, because my burden is always for the non-Tamil states, because so much is done. There is a lot of even overlapping going on in Tamil Nadu and Kerala. But there are places like Gujarat, where we just now had some blasts, and then uh, places like uh, Rajasthan, uh, where uh, there is so much of uh, political disturbance and in places like Uttar Pradesh, uh, that long Hindi belt where from uh, we have uh, the top leaders of India coming. So all these places, the churches are pretty weak. So it is necessary that we talk about the missionary work in all these places. We also concentrate on the existing Christian congregations and community. Because unless the church is um, strengthened, we won't be able to contain the results of evangelism. As much as we prepare the nets to go to the sea for fishing, we also should prepare the baskets to contain the fish that we will have in the catch. Uh, it is necessary that the church is revived before the world can be reached. I always make a statement that uh, uh, sick church cannot uh, save or help a dying world. So it is necessary that uh, the church is healed. The famous text we have in uh, Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people, and that's where God begins, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways and pray, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and then I would heal their land. So everything has to start with and begin with God's people. So I tend to spend uh, more time in uh, the revival ministries in the churches and congregations. And basically, as uh, you all must have found by now, uh, today is the fourth day that I'm ministering to you, that I'm not an evangelist, so I don't accept evangelistic conventions and campaigns. Uh, I'm only a Bible teacher, so where there are Christians and God's people who want to uh, know the mind of the Lord and understand His Word 
and then grow in scriptural understanding and knowledge and God's um, a purpose for their lives for times like this, I find myself there to go and minister to them. So I very much request you to pray for me as I would be traveling all over uh, India and other parts of this world also, um, that God would uh, continue to fulfill the purpose for which he has called me in the year 1962 to study his word and to share his word. I continue to be a sincere student of God's word. If the Lord would give me another life, I would spend more time in study and less time in preaching because that's my only regret. I have not uh, spent enough time. I have done more than several of my contemporaries, but basically I believe there is still so much that I would like to spend time with to study in God's Word. The deeper you go, the greater you find are the riches. It's so, but you, you never find an end for that. So it, it's a lifetime occupation. That's why I believe perhaps the Bible will accompany us to heaven. Uh, everything that you see today is uh, temporal. This, um, this microphone is temporal, this uh, lectern is temporal, the seats are temporal, and anything that you see in this world is temporal. That means you won't see it in eternity, with one exception, the, the Bible. Uh, that will be with us in heaven, I believe. Because we will need to consult Isaiah and Jeremiah. Some of the things which they wrote, we don't understand. Even the best of commentators, they very carefully and conveniently avoid interpreting those passages. So we'd like to go and spend some time to, with uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah and all those people to understand because it will be a, a lifetime uh, occupation for us. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Uh, uh, the new heaven and earth, new earth will come, but the word of the Lord will always stand forever. So I am sure that during the last uh, three, four days of my ministry here in this uh, gathering, uh, I have uh, given you a lot of appetite to go deep into God's Word, to study, to spend more time, uh, because ultimately that's what's going to keep us safe. <clears throat> now today, uh, I would like to conclude this uh, series of talks. You know, on the first day I spoke to you on deception, and then on the second day I spoke to you on another gospel. And yesterday I spoke to you about another spirit and how we have to discern the spirits. I gave you four uh, uh, God-given means of discerning the spirits. It's not uh, just enough if we, uh, if, um, some of us have the gift of discernment. It is necessary that all of us grow in the art of discernment. That's what maturity is. Now I'd like to conclude this series of talks. There is so much to say, maybe another time. Uh, but I would like to conclude this series of talks this time. Uh, talking about balance, Christian balance. <clears throat> Years ago, I was suffering from a very funny disease. When I'm walking or when I'm traveling, and many times when I was driving, or even when I was on pulpit, uh, uh, I would be even holding the lectern tight, but I would suddenly lose my balance. And that would actually begin after a time of humming of my, one of my ears, and then I would lose my balance. I'll try to manage. There were times when I was preaching. Usually my sermons are seven-point sermons. So when I was just, I would be through with the five points, and before I come to the sixth point, I would begin to struggle. I knew I was going for going in for that. And there were occasions when, when I was making a mention of the seventh point, sometimes I'd fall flat and then I'd go for a vomiting. It, it, it's a big episode. And then it takes time for me to recover. Now, I had lots of consultation with uh, people on this uh, particular problem that I had. They said there is no permanent cure for that because they called it a syndrome. And the name they gave to this syndrome was Menier syndrome. Uh, they said that this is something that you have to, you must learn how to manage it. There is no permanent cure for that. Then I wanted to just find out uh, what is the anatomical thing about it. And they said that you have got some fluid uh, in your uh, labyrinth, in your ear. And that gets tilted. And then due to some reason, it gets tilted. Um, even if there is a small particle, now maybe that uh, the, the fluid level gets tilted. Where it is that fluid level which actually gives us equilibrium and balance. So once that level is tilted, uh, you throw out of balance. Now whatever you do, you won't be able to manage it. And the air travel makes it all the worse. And for a person like that, preaching, you know, do a lot of travel and then a lot of stress and strain, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Now this was terrible. And they said that you won't have a permanent cure. But I just looked to the face of the Lord. I said, Lord, I, will, I, I want you to heal me. I want you to touch me and heal me. Otherwise, I would be very incapacitated for uh, the calling that you have given me. God is in his mercy, chose to heal me. I was uh, free of that for 15 years. Still, it surfaced again a year ago. Uh, but uh, there I, I thought, no, that's it, finished. 
but the Lord again healed me, so I'm all right. So hopefully today I will also finish my seven points. Uh, praise God. So this uh, balance is uh, very important. That's what I want to talk to you about, this balance in Christian life. Take birds. Uh, no bird can fly without two wings. You just uh, injure one wing. You know, I grow a lot of pigeons at home. I got about 150 or 200 pigeons. It's one of my hobbies. And, uh, you know, sometimes what happens, these uh, gypsies, they shoot these pigeons. And um, if they manage to escape by just getting hit on one of the wings, they still come home flying, but they won't be able to fly straight. They'll just fly in circles. They go nowhere. They just fly in circles. They're wounded. So that loses your balance. You take a train. A train cannot go unless there are two rails. Both are necessary. And you take a coin. A coin will not go uh, if both sides don't have the inscription. Uh, we need uh, two sides for a coin. Truth is always parallel. This is a very important statement. It's a very important truth about truth. Truth is parallel. It always have, has got two sides. If you don't take one side of the truth, it becomes uh, uh, a greater error than error itself. Half truth is more dangerous than a bald-faced lie. Now, most of the false doctrines that we have in the Christian world today, they are not total lie, but they are half truth. I want you to understand that. That's why they can still quote the Bible. They take a little bit here and there, but it has not been developed into a full spectrum. I would begin with a very simple illustration uh, from Book of Matthew, fourth chapter. As I have been repeatedly telling, I'm not tired of telling that again. It is to your advantage. Uh, please do turn to your Bibles. And if you don't have a copy of your Bible, please share the Bibles of your neighbors. And um, please put off your cell phones. Don't even keep it in the vibration mode. We'll just listen to the Word of God as the Spirit ministers God's Word to us. Now here is the Lord Jesus Christ in the fourth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Uh, he was uh, facing uh, a series of temptations from Satan following his 40 days of fasting and prayer. Now here in the third verse of the fourth chapter, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus immediately answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Jesus said it is written. Because Jesus said it is written, the devil immediately copied it. That's why I told you yesterday that the devil is a, he, 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 he's a cop, he's a Xerox copy, he's a counterfeit. And look at the fifth verse. Then the devil took him up into a holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written. Because Jesus said it is written, now the devil also says it is written. He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is also written. You know, the problem with us Christians is that we know what is written, but we don't know what is also written. Now what is written must be balanced by what is also written, what is again written. Now that's what I said, the, the truth is always parallel. When the devil quotes us some scripture text, we should not immediately fall uh, flat before that. We should be able to find out what is also written. Because there are always pairs in the Bible. The truth is always parallel. Now once you forget one side of the truth, once you fail to notice what is also written on the face of what is written, if you fail to interpolate it, you know what will happen? You go off tangent. And what happens, you uh, the, the divisions in the church, especially in many spiritual churches, it is mainly because people go off tangent taking one side or one aspect of the truth. Now this morning, I am going to uh, talk to you seven vital areas where we need balance. In fact, there are many. Maybe I have done about 30 or 40 of them where we need balance. But I would like to deal with just seven of them this morning. I would call them very vital, crucial areas where we need to maintain balance in our Christian life and ministry, both individually <clears throat> as Christians and corporately as a church. Follow this message carefully, and wherever the Lord would <clears throat> convict you to go through, <clears throat> excuse me, to go through some correction, uh, be open and be available for any alteration. The first area where we need um, balance is between Bible meditation and prayer. Between Bible meditation and prayer. 
What does it mean? There are some people who spend too much time with study of the Bible, but very little time in prayer. Whereas there are others who spend too much time in prayer, but very little time in Bible study. But I believe uh, these are like two wings. Now these are like the two sides of the coin. We need both this and that. Strictly speaking, we should spend more time in listening to God than talking to God. We should give priority primarily to listen to God or let God speak to us before we utter a word unto Him. How do we say that? This is not uh, some technique that I'm trying to develop or a philosophy that I'm trying to just originate. That's what is told us uh, in the wisdom book of the Old Testament. Turn with me, the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, book of Ecclesiastes, uh, you know, some translations would call it as the preachers. So because uh, Solomon himself was, uh, even though he was a king, he was a preacher of wisdom. You see what he says in the fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes. I will read to you the first two verses. Walk prudently when you go to the house of God. Now that can be interpreted as when you go into the presence of God. When you begin your devotional life. Or when you begin your morning devotion or quiet time. Whatever. Draw near to hear. Rather than to give the sacrifice of fools. In other words, go to hear rather than to speak. And then he says in verse 2. Do not be rash with your mouth. Don't just start speaking when you get into the presence of God. Don't just open up and pour out everything. Let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. He said the stress is on let your words be few. God is in heaven. You are on earth. Don't just go just to speak out everything. Go to hear rather than to speak because God is in heaven and you are on earth and you are before that almighty awesome God let your words be few now what's the spirit of the passage hear God speak rather than dictate to God and asking him to hear so beloved here we have got the, uh, the this exercise this is a balancing of this exercise I was telling you that we need to learn lots of lessons from early revivals not only from church history, but also from Bible history. The Bible is full of revivals. The ministry under King, uh, the, the time, the reign of King Hezekiah, that was a time of revival. And Josiah, who became uh, a king when he was pretty young, unusual revival. And Ezra, that was a great revival. Nehemiah, that was a great revival. Now, if you look at these revivals, you'll find the balance that they give to these two fold spiritual discipline. For example, turn with the middle book of Nehemiah. Look at these passages. Nehemiah, ninth chapter, where the revival was very much on, the heat was on, and people were getting restored to their blessings. Some of the things that they have lost and some of the festivals they have not been celebrating for many, many long years. They started to celebrate them. And as you come to the ninth chapter of Nehemiah, look at the third words. They stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one fourth of the day. And for the another fourth, they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Are you able to see a balance here? So I don't know how you are going to divide it. Sometimes this uh, one fourth, the people divide it as 24 hours, one fourth, six hours, six hours. Or if you like to call morning six to evening six, the 12 hour period, whatever it is. Now we are more concerned about the proportion. Six hours, what were they doing? They were reading from the book of God. First they were hearing. And in response to what they were reading or hearing from the word of God, the next six hours, what were they doing? They were confessing their sins. They were worshipping God. Are you with me? You understand? This is what it is. It's so plain. So very simple. There is no complication in the interpretation of that passage. So our prayers, our worship, our confession, or whatever we say in the presence of God, strictly is only in response to what we understand from what God speaks to us through His Word. Only then it will be qualitative. Otherwise, it will be the sacrifice of fools. You know, too many revivals, I told you, or even on the first day, too many revivals have died out too soon before accomplishing the purpose for which God sent them. You know why? 
Too much of time was spent in excitement, worship, and praise, and prayer, and fasting, and intercession. All good things. They are all prescribed in the Bible. They are all disciplines, no doubt. But proportionately, sufficient time was not spent in the ministry of God's word. Do you know that many false doctrines came up following some preacher spending 40 days in fasting and prayer? So many false doctrines have come after some preacher spending 40 days in fasting and prayer. So if anybody goes fasting and prayer, I just pray, Lord, keep him safe. Nothing wrong in fasting and prayer. But during the time of fasting and prayer, you are supposed to be feasting on the word of God. That's what Jesus said. He was fasting on his physical food, material food, for 40 days. And the devil came to him and suggested, why don't you just turn the stones into bread? It is a very legitimate proposal, suggestion, isn't it? Now you and I, if we had had that temptation, I don't know about you, but I tell you, I will immediately, I will try, whether during the 40 days I have received enough power or not to at least turn the stones into bread. I would have tried it. Well, there was nothing wrong. On the face of it, there was nothing wrong in that uh, suggestion. But you know, Jesus Christ identified, diagnosed something else. That cunning, subtle scheme in the sinister scheme of the Satan. You know what Jesus said? Devil, you thought that I was fasting? I was fasting on material food. But I was feasting on the word of God. Because the Bible, that's what he said. Man shall not live by bread alone. You, you thought I was fasting. No, I was literally feasting. Because I was living on the every word of God. That was proceeding out of the mouth of my father God. Praise the Lord. Beloved, this is what we should understand. And today, I want to really thank God for the, the spirit of uh, worship that is catching up in our congregations. Everywhere, you know, we talk about praise and worship. And we've got worship leaders, we've got worship seminars, we've got praise and worship things going. Praise God for that. But there is a great danger. In some services, especially in Sunday services, where God's people come together, the worship takes so much time and energy, it leaves people with very little time and energy to unhurriedly meditate and learn God's word. But in the early days, in some churches, the pulpit will not be like this on the ground. The pulpit will be very high. You have to climb stairs to go to the pulpit. You know why they did like that? The most important thing when God's people come together is to hear God. It was given that place. Because my Bible says, God has magnified His word above all His name. We should never ever forget it. So you are a congregation. I am very happy that this congregation is a growing congregation. It's a very live congregation. As much time as you spend for worship, that much time and if possible even more, should be given to the solid teaching and meditation of God's word. Otherwise, you will lose the balance. Many congregations have already lost the balance. And at times, it may be helpful that we start with Bible meditation or Bible preaching and then go to worship. Sometimes that may be helpful. You know why? You know, when we worship with all our uh, lifting up of hands and shouting and praise and then these musical instruments, physically, sometimes we become pretty tired. And, um, and so, you know, when the preacher comes up, you know, he has to literally not revive the congregation. He has to resurrect the congregation. It happens many times. So I have faced that difficulty because people are oh, exhausted. Worship is over. And they are just fresh enough for the study of God's word. So occasionally, there's nothing wrong. Occasionally, you can have the word first and worship next. Why not? There's nothing wrong. Because when you understand the word, your worship can become more meaningful. I said, brother, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Now, in, in, uh, I, there is uh, no rule that first there should be worship and then there should be word. There can be word and worship and worship and word. So always balance between the Bible meditation and prayer. The next area where we need to have balance is between the study of the Old Testament and New Testament. Old Testament and New Testament. Now, I always believe that uh, the two testaments are the two lips of God through which God speaks to us. You hold only and try to say you aren't able to see anything. You know, you need both the lips to really speak, right? These are two lips, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, in the New Testament, 
and in the Old Testament, there are certain things when you look at it and you should concern. In the Old Testament, the New Testament is concealed. In the New Testament, the Old Testament is revealed. Now, this, uh, this, this counterpart, this thing you should have to, one is the counterpart of the other, you need to understand it. The Old Testament is inside the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is opened up in the New Testament, it is opened, it is revealed. That's why the Bible says in Matthew 13th chapter, come with me, these are all some, now this morning for, for short of shortage of time, I don't uh, go for full exposition of any scripture text, but I hope you'll appreciate. Now turn with me to Matthew 13th chapter, it's a long chapter, look at the 52nd verse. Then Jesus said to them, Every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now here is a picture of how we these days should, you know, for us this is the treasure. Now this is household of God, the word of God. We have got new and old. So bring out both the new and old from God's holy word. You remember I started with a very important scripture text and I want you to just recollect it without turning to it. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17, what did he say? All scripture is profitable. You like that word all? I stressed so much of, I put so much of stress on that word and I even asked you to encircle that word. All scripture, there is no appendix in the Bible. There is nothing that is unnecessary. There is nothing that is extra in the Bible. There is no addendum in the Bible. All scripture is not only given by God, but all scripture is profitable for us. All that happened to the people of Israel in the Old Testament, that was with a divine purpose. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10th chapter. And look at the 11th verse. You know, this is what makes Bible study so interesting and one full time, one lifetime is not sufficient. First Corinthians 10th chapter and the 11th verse. All these things happen to them. Again, I like that word, all. All these things happen to them. To who? Do, to who? The, upper, the uh, Israelites. The people of the Old Testament. The people of God's covenant in the Old Testament. All these things happen to them as example. And they were written for our admonition. They are written for us who are living in the New Testament times. On whom the ends of the ages have come. You know, we are living in the last days. When did the last days begin? Come on, let me see how much you have. Uh, you remember what I said. When did the last days begin? With the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. With the descent of the Holy Spirit. So here it is written. On those who, whom the end of the ages has come. That means Christians. So whatever happened to the people of Israel are written in the Bible for whose learning? For our learning, New Testament Christians. And they are written for us. Now there comes a question. Then beloved, uh, how, how, why, why, is, why is it that many times we are, we are no more under the old covenant, we are only under the new covenant? Now how do you reconcile that? Now let me, I know that, that's a big subject, but I'll just make it very brief and precise for you to understand. The Old Covenant or the Old Testament or the, the laws and regulations in the Old Testament, they are still valid, but all the ceremonial part of the Old Testament is gone. The spiritual part is still intact. Take for example, one young lawyer came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he asked a question to Jesus. What should I do to, do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus simply said, obey the commandments. And he said, which commandments? And Jesus started narrating one, two, three, four, five. If you very carefully study the list, you can make it a homework. He left out the Sabbath aspect of it. He made no reference to Sabbath when he narrated or listed out those commandments. Because of the Ten Commandments, there is only one thing that is ceremonial, that is Sabbath keeping. So that is why it is not taught anywhere in the New Testament. Very carefully if you study it. The festivals, the sacrifices, 
their dietary regulations all these things are not binding on the New Testament Christians today take for example in the Old Testament you know God said don't eat this don't eat this don't eat this but we have found it these days that whatever God said don't eat it they are tastier than the other stuff you know God said don't eat the shellfish but shellfish is very tasty crab is very tasty lobster is very tasty Beef is good, but we prefer, uh, we prefer pork, at least ribs. So whatever was forbidden is very tasty. Now that is why I had a bypass surgery in 1996. <laughs> because I ate all the forbidden things in the world. Anything that which would uh, crawl and that which would uh, uh, hop and that which, everything. Sorry, keep it within yourself. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Every imaginable thing on the face of the earth I was eating. So I had a problem. Devil did not give me heart problem. I ate. Stanley was responsible for his heart problem. So, you know, in the Old Testament, there are certain things which God said don't take. But if you look into this medical science, you find, besides religious ceremonial reason, God also had a medical reason why he didn't want mankind to eat that. But today, if you eat those things, it is not sin, but you will have a surgery. <laughs> Are you with me? Are you with me? Now, how do I say that? Turn with me to the book of Romans, 14th chapter. This is the Bible. Romans, 14th chapter. I will read to you verses 5 and 6. One person, you know, this is a New Testament establishment now. One person esteems one day above another. You know, some people esteem Sunday better than the other, other days. And some people, especially in the Gulf nations, they don't go for Sundays. They go for Fridays because that's the national holiday. So they have all their services on Fridays. Okay, whatever it is. One person esteems one day above another. But another person esteems every day alike. And what is the rule? Let each person be fully convinced in his own mind. Here is a freedom that's given. And then it says in verse 6, that's what's interesting is, He who observes the day, if you keep one day special, exclusive, if you do that, you are observing it to the Lord. If you do not observe the day to the Lord, you do not observe. You know, what a freedom. If you keep one day as a special day, it is to the Lord. If you don't keep one day as special to the Lord, it is still to the Lord that you are not keeping it. You are open. Not only that, about the diet, not only about the days, or about the diet. He who eats, eats to the Lord because he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and he gives God thanks. Each person, let him be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now, this is the only difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. God has set some rules, some regulations, especially to just show them differentiated, separated from the pagans among whom they were living, in the land of idolatry where they were living. But as we move to the New Testament, God gives us total freedom and liberty for us to choose. When I say the ceremonial part of the Old Testament is set aside, the moral side is not set aside. In fact, the moral standard is still heightened. What did Jesus say? You have heard in the days of old, as told by Moses, you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, even if you look at a woman to lust after her, you have already committed adultery with her. So Jesus actually has heightened the moral standard. In the Old Testament it was said that thou shalt not murder. But I say unto you, whoever hates his brother is a murderer of men. So you find the ceremonial part of the Old Testament set aside to be given freedom to people to choose so that each person will be persuaded in his own mind. But when it comes to the question of the moral aspect of it, things have become even more strict. But that is a difference. 
in the Old Testament, whatever God gave the commandments, he wrote it on tablets of stone. And people had to go and read it. But in the New Testament, God made it different. Instead of writing it on stone, he wrote it on the hearts of flesh. For what? Not to ignore. He puts within us an inward ability to obey his commandments. That's what we call grace. That inward enablement that God implants in you to obey the commandments that he has written on the flesh tablets of your heart. That's what grace is. It's no more I, but Christ. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now, this is a big subject. I don't want to go, go, go to it. But I want you to understand that Old Testament, New Testament, both have a vital purpose in God's revelation. We should keep both of them when we study the Bible. Law came through Moses. Turn with me to John 1, 7. You know that verse? John 1st chapter, and look at the 17th verse. John 1, 17. The law was given through Moses. But, will you read that for me? But, huh? not grace alone, grace and truth. So God has not sacrificed truth when he talked about grace. Do you understand? Law came through Moses. The Bible does not say, but grace came through Jesus. But the Bible says, grace and truth. God does not sacrifice the truth aspect of it. Grace and truth came through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now how are we going to balance it? I will give you a practical suggestion which I am following. If you read Old Testament once, try to read New Testament twice. Because we are now living under the New Covenant. The Old Covenant is obsolete. We are not now an Old Covenant people. The Old Covenant is explained in that Old Testament which is the book. But we are living under the New Covenant. Because we are the New Covenanted people. So I would strongly urge you that every time you go through the 39 books of the Old Testament once, Go through the 27 books of the New Testament twice. That, God, that gives you a proper balance. If you spend too much time with the Old Testament, you will become a joyless Christian. If you spend too much time with the New Testament, and if you neglect the Old Testament, you will become a careless Christian. We need to keep both in proper tension. Read the Old and read the New. One best way to do that is to turn to the central column references and the side margin references you have in your Bibles. Because invariably, they take you back and forth in the whole Bible. Back and forth. So you read something here, and there is a parallel there in the Old Testament. And you read something in the Old Testament, you immediately are thrown into the New Testament page. So that keeps you in perfect balance, and that gives you a healthy tension in your biblical understanding. Now the third area where we need to maintain balance, I'm going rather fast today, I'm not spending enough time on each subject, but I think uh, this would be just sufficient for you, and you'll have to do your further review and your research. The third area where we need to maintain balance is between love for God and love for men. Love for God and love for men. You know the passage very well. Matthew's Gospel, 22nd chapter, from verse 35 to 40. There was one young lawyer, he came to the Lord Jesus Christ. He asked him a question, Lord, which is the greatest of all commandment? You know why he asked that question? You know, as an advocate, as a young lawyer, he would have stacked his library with lots of law books, including the law books of Moses. And reading through all of them, hundreds of them, maybe he was growing, he was getting some mental fatigue. So he came to Jesus, too much. Now tell me which is the greatest of all commandments. And Jesus said, Love your God with all your heart, 
with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your spirit. He said something which he did not ask for. He did not ask Jesus which was the first commandment. He simply asked God which was the greatest of all commandments. But Jesus said, this is the first and the greatest of commandments. As far as that young man was concerned, the answer was complete and over there. But as far as Jesus was concerned, the answer was not complete. And Jesus went one step further and he said, the second commandment, which is equal to the first commandment, is that you love your neighbor as yourself. Because it is second commandment, it is not a secondary commandment. That's why Jesus said, it is equal to the first commandment. Are you with me? He didn't ask for it, isn't it? Did he ask what was the second commandment? He asked what is the first, well, what was the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, answer the third question, will take you off balance and off tangent if I do not tell you the other side of the coin also. Jesus was the perfectly balanced person. Love God and love man. And you know these are interlinked. That is why Apostle John came forth with a very striking hammering question. You know what he said? If a man does not love a brother whom he has seen, how shall he love God whom he has not seen? One is interlinked with the other. One is not independent of other, but one is interdependent on the other. They are interwoven, they are interlocked. You know, we have no problem in loving God. Why? God is an abstract person. <laughs> but we have problem in loving people. Why? People are very tangible. <laughs> <laughs> Any theory is okay for us. Practice is always a problem. We have no problem in loving God. But we always have problem in loving people. Who is my neighbor? That man asked, who is my neighbor? But do you know that Jesus did not give him an answer and an example of who is my neighbor? He gave an answer, who is not my neighbor? You have to read the Bible very carefully. The answer was not, who is my neighbor? The answer was for the question, who is not my neighbor? You read the Bible yourself, then you will understand. There were two people who loved God. One was a priest. He goes to the temple to offer sacrifices and pray on behalf of the people. He loves God. And the other was a Levite. He also was there to love God. They were too busy loving God to find time to love people. How is it? <laughs> you can be so occupied in your so-called love and devotion and worship and praise for God that you may forget your obligation to mankind. That was the problem of tithing in the Old Testament. Turn with me to a very important book. I won't tell the name of the book. Let me see a little bit of your scripture knowledge. 23.23 of... 23, 23 of Matthew. Yeah, very good. 23, 23 of Matthew. Turn with me to that passage. It's very interesting. You know, uh, several important texts in the Bible, thank God for this chapter and uh, verse divisions, you know, they go, they go very easy for this arithmetic. 23, 23 of uh, book of Matthew. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. <laughs> you are not giving tithe. That's why, owe to you. That's not what he said. You are giving tithe. Tithe of what? You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. They pay tithe not only of their salaries, but also pay tithe of their spices. Everything. But you have neglected what? The weight here. Weight here. Underline that word weight here. Tithing is easy, but there is something which is weightier than that. But you have neglected, conveniently you have set aside, the weightier matter of the law. What is the weightier matter of the law? Justice, mercy, 
it's actually the word is not faith, actually the word is faithfulness. It all is in our interpersonal relationship. That is to, jo to show justice to people to whom justice is not meted out. The marginalized people, the neglected people, the downtrodden people, the underprivileged people of society. You are not shown to that, but you are interested in giving big, big offerings to God. And Jesus then strikes a balance. This you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Is it a balance? Are we studying a proper subject this morning? Balance. Do this, but don't leave that undone. Have both. As much as you think of your spiritual obligation in giving your money unto God, think of also your social obligation to help those who are in need. You know, Christianity is all full of this. Let's go through some quick recollection. That was Christmas. An angelly host appeared. And what did they say? Glory to God in the highest. Did they stop there? They said, goodwill towards men. It is not only glory to God in the highest, it is goodwill towards men. That was Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was outpoured on the early church. What do we read about them? Turn with me to the passage, Acts 2nd chapter, and verse 47. Because this may not be a very familiar verse for you, I am turning it. But the Christmas passage, we are only too familiar with. Acts 2nd chapter, and look at verse 47. Praising God. You know, this early church all the time, from house to house, breaking bread, and they were praising God. Did they stop there? And? And? Having favor with all the people. That is why the Lord added to the church daily those who are getting saved. It's good to be praising God, and it's very easy to neglect of a social dimension of our Christian life. Sometimes we become too heavenly minded to be of any earthly use. Super spiritual, but not down to earth practical. You know there were two outstanding names for Jesus. Did you ever think about that? Jesus is not only the Son of God, He is also the Son of Man. Hallelujah. You know how he brings both together? He's not only the son of God, but he's also the son of man. That is why we hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, 12 years, just returning from the temple in Jerusalem, the Bible says, the boy Jesus grew in favor with God and favor with man. Right? Right? The spiritual and the social dimension. What's the symbol of Christianity? Now, the, the, no answer is complete, but generally it is accepted that the symbol of Christianity is a cross. There are two, various shapes of cross, T-shaped, X-shaped, various shapes of cross which the Romans used in their time for punishment, capital punishment. But one most accepted traditional uh, form of cross was this cross with two staves. One vertical staff and the other the horizontal staff. I believe the message is very clear there. The vertical staff speaks about man's relationship with God. And the horizontal staff speaks about man's relationship with his fellow man. That's why the, the message of the gospel is a message of reconciliation. Man gets right with God. And man gets right with his fellow man. That's why Jesus said, when you come to the altar... To offer a gift unto God. And there you suddenly remember that your brother has something against you. Not you having anything against your brother. He goes one step further. Your brother has got something against you. If you remember that, don't offer the gift. Just leave the gift. There's a difference between offering the gift and leaving the gift. He said, leave the gift near the altar. First, go get reconciled. And after reconciling with your brother, don't worry, nobody will take this offering. You come back and then you offer your gift. Otherwise, if you are not right with men, if you are not right with one another, if you are faulty in your interpersonal relationship, 
the offerings that you give to the church may be registered here in this register but it will not be recorded there over there so get right with men and get right with God these two should go always together fourthly the fourth area where we need balance is between family and work our preachers family and ministry you know, there are two extremes. For some people, work, 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 no family. For others, family, 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 work neglected or ministry neglected. I think both these things should be avoided. I want to tell you something. Family is the unit to test a man and train a man. Immediately some men are blinking. How about women? That I'll come to you next. But this is time to address the men. You know why? I don't know about here. But in India, from the time I was a young boy, you know, I come from an Anglican church and then I attended various churches. You know what they will say? Today afternoon there will be a mother's meeting. But nobody will say there is a father's meeting. And they will say, we are going to have a special meeting. That is ladies meeting. Why not gentlemen meeting? As if women are the worst sinners in the world. I don't know about your church, do you come from? It's all special meeting for ladies, special meeting for mothers. Have you come across father's meeting? Special meeting for fathers? But the Bible very clearly says, puts the greater responsibility on the head of the man. You know what the Bible says? If a man does not know how to take care of his own family, how can he take the church of God? Or how can he lead the church of God? Or how can he do anything in society for other people? If you are a failure at home, you are a failure everywhere. If you are a failure at home, you are a failure everywhere. You know, Jesus Christ as a teenager, he always balanced both. They went to the temple for celebration. It was only 12 years. I think it was a big gala. Maybe we can call it, uh, in a, a, you know, Thiruvula. It was a big festival. And his parents went back, not even trying to check up whether their son was with him, with their, or them or not, because, you know, so many relatives were around. Oh, if he's not here, he'll be there. What is there? So they went. How many days? One day? Two days? Three days. So it was a real jubilant time. And suddenly they realized, oh, this fellow is not there. And they came back. And Jesus was sitting there. Very coolly and quietly, he was not only asking questions, he was also answering questions. So immediately, the mother would come. You know, Joseph was very quiet. He, he was a very clever man. He didn't ask anything. So the mother asked him, Son, why did you do like this to us? Your father and I, we had to really search for you. Then Jesus said, You are talking about that father, but I am talking about my father's business. Should I not be after my father's business? Mary did not understand. She simply kept it in her heart, the Bible says. Too many things that lady was carrying. Too many things. Before marriage, she was carrying a baby. Now, after delivery and after bringing forth this boy, again, lots of heaviness. The Bible says, Mary kept it in her heart. With whom will she serve? She said, why are you doing like this to your father? And he is saying, don't you know I must be after my father? You know, just imagine that time. Today when you read the Bible, it looks different. But at that time, you know how that mother would have felt. How any mother would feel if you feel like that, if the son answers like that. So did he say, I, I am not coming. You just go, you mind your business, and you go and help your uh, beloved hubby or husband, whatever it is, and then uh, just to help in the carpentry shop. Did he say like that? No. You know what the Bible says? He went with them and he was subject to them. He talked about the spiritual commitment and at the same time he did not leave his family obligation. Twelve years to thirty years Jesus was a carpenter. Very faithful carpenter. He, didn't even, he not only knew how to make a cross, he also knew how to carry a cross. He learned to making a cross for eighteen years and he started carrying a cross at the end of those 18 years. 
And you said, brother, now well, how about husband and wife? Uh, Jesus never got married. Do you know why Jesus never got married? Do you know why he did not get married? First of all, he knew that he would die. And then he would leave a widow behind. He left a mother behind, everybody is worshipping that mother. Suppose he has left a widow behind, you know what would happen. I mean, just trying to. You know what we are all capable of. So Jesus was wise and he didn't want to get married and get into all this confusion. But the Bible says Christ loved the church. So he shows it in a different context. Christ loved the church, so you husbands, you need to love your, hus your wives. So there is no area where you don't find a pattern in the Lord Jesus Christ. In everything, Jesus Christ is the perfect pattern. That's why he said, follow me. That's why he said, imitate me. Every disciple must be like his guru. Just be like me. So Jesus, in the context of the spiritual commitment or obligation, he never lost sight of his familial thing. Now I just want to give you a triangle, a little bit of geometry, let me just give you. You know, let's take a straight triangle, not the inverted triangle, but the straight triangle, with the apex on the top and then the, and then the bottom line, the baseline, just left on the level. So it has got three, three corners. Put God and the apex, that is at the top. And put your uh, work or ministry on the other side, and put your family on the other side. Now this is what every man of God should maintain his uh, balance. Don't neglect one for the other. Keep both in proper tension. In family and in your work spot. In family and in your church. Don't lose one for the other. Don't neglect or sacrifice one for the other. Hold these together. This would be a solid, steady, stable triangle. Always keep this picture before you. You lose one. You are there for a great confusion. The fifth area where we need to maintain balance, about which I spoke to you day before yesterday, prosperity and adversity. Prosperity and adversity. You know, once upon a time, uh, if you are 50 years or 55 years old, you know that uh, the concept in spiritual circles was, the deeper the poverty, the greater your spirituality. <laughs> So there are preachers who never used to wear shoes and they would just go barefooted and they would not have some good dresses. Uh, you know, that, that was, I mean, the, the simpler you are, the more spiritual you would be. You know, that kind of concept was there once upon a time. But now the pendulum has swung to the other extreme. You know, we're always like that in a pendulum, either there or here. In Tamil, you know, we used to say, I don't know about in Malayalam, you know, <laughs> you, know you, you just go any either side only. You never, uh, you, you try to maintain a balance. You know, prosperity, thank God for it, when God prospers you, prosperity is not an indicator of spirituality. Some of the richest people in the world have nothing to do with the living God. It doesn't prove anything. In the same way, there are people, the poorest of the poor, but God has made them rich in faith. And I gave you the example of Mary, how she was too poor to bring a lamb along with her son to the temple for dedication. All that she could afford was to bring two turtle doves. But nevertheless, that was not a curse that was upon her. She was highly favored of the Lord. We need to have a balance. How should we have a balance? Come again with me to that wisdom book, book of Ecclesiastes. 7 chapter 14 the words. It's easy to remember. 7 14 of Ecclesiastes. I remember many scripture texts like that. 7 14 of Ecclesiastes. It's a balance. I'll read that for you. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. Surely God has appointed the one as well as the other. So that man can find nothing that will happen after him. Who gives prosperity? God gives prosperity. Who gives adversity? God gives adversity. That's what my Bible says. God has appointed the one as well as the other. Both are always there. That is why that man Job, 
You know, I believe Job is the uh, oldest book in the Bible. The first written book in the Bible is book of Job. Even Genesis was written after that. Chronologically, no. But uh, writing, the authorship wise, that was written later. Job is perhaps the oldest of books in the whole Bible. And we have a wonderful truth in that book. God had richly blessing us, very prosperous. He knew this truth. Prosperity comes from the hand of God. He liked it. He blessed the Lord for that. But one day, sons gone, camels gone, property gone, servants gone, everything gone, finally, health gone, skin gone. And the spouse comes before him. And she says, are you still standing in your integrity? Why didn't you curse God and die? And this man comes out with a tremendous theology. We who have received good from the Lord, shall we not receive bad also? And you know what he said? God gave. God took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, one day I had a preacher, a prosperity preacher telling, what Job said was not right. You know what he said? God gave his truth, but God took away his not truth. But if you look at the book of Job, first chapter, second chapter, come on, come to that. Because you also should not be carried away with some misinterpretations of the Bible. We should take the Bible always in the context, and I have been telling you. Look at the second chapter, or even the first chapter, look at the 21st words. Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now I want to know whether what, Paul, what Job said was right or wrong. You know how I know what he said was right? The next verse says, 22nd verse, In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. In other words, what he said in verse 21 is endorsed by the Holy Spirit as that it was right. This is why I said contextual interpretation. And not only that, you look at verse 9 of the second chapter. His wife is called, challenging him, why don't you curse God and die? Second chapter, ninth verse. But he said to her, tenth verse, hey, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Did what he say right or wrong? It was right. How do we say that? The next sentence says, In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Unless we are careful, we may be totally misled by some very casual interpretation of the scriptures. So prosperity and adversity come from God. If it is all day, I tell you, suppose the sun is there for 24 hours a day, would you like it? But praise God. God in his wisdom gives us day and night. But very interestingly, it is not day first and night next. It is night first and day next. Do you know that? What was the first day? The first day was it day and night or night and day? Huh? Oh, what was the first day? Night and day or day and night? Huh? <laughs> Better we go back to the first page of the Bible. We are restudying the Bible, praise God. Look at the first chapter. First chapter. And look at the fifth words. God called the night day, and the darkness he called night. Huh. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So if there is evening in your life now, don't immediately compare yourself with other people, but thank God for it because there is always an end to the tunnel. For some people the night may be much longer for than other people. But even in the night of your life, you don't see bright sunshine or beams dashing across your windows. Don't lose heart. Trust in the Lord. The Lord shall be your light. Life may not be light for you, but the Lord shall be your light. 
earlier you learned this lesson dearly beloved the less chances are there that you will be disillusioned in your Christian life if somebody says everything will be rosy 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 for you don't believe that story it is not Bible it is only a bubble both adversity and prosperity come from the hand of God now coming to the sixth aspect of our balance evangelism and charity evangelism and charity you know some people all the time they talk about the needs of the soul reaching people for salvation but there are others who are not concerned about people's salvation they are only concerned about people's starvation some people all the time talking about preaching 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 of the gospel and whereas others all the time they talk about distributing food and distributing clothes and doing relief work I think both are necessary both are necessary if somebody is naked somebody is clothless somebody is foodless don't go and touch him brother don't worry I'm praying for you the Lord will take care of you that is nonsense who said it Apostle James said it turn with me to book of James second chapter it is actually condemned that kind of super spiritual approach is condemned James second chapter and look at verses 15 to 17 you know how directly these verses come to us if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food here brother and sister speak not about our own kith and kin it speaks about brothers and sisters in Christ in the church so that means there can be believers who are without food there can be believers without dress there can be a possibility of many believers living in without prosperity is there it is there it is possible the poor will always be there and one of you says to them giving a benediction what that fellow needs is not a benediction what he needs is some bread God bless you brother don't worry and putting your hand upon don't worry brother I'm praying for you God will take care of you. some crow will drop some uh, bread crumbs for you on the way pick it up it says if somebody says depart in peace be warmed and filled be warm think positive why you think negative think some positive things you know, God will give me bread God will give me bread keep on shouting on the way you'll get it be filled be warmed you know don't feel don't say I'm feeling cold I'm feeling cold I'm feeling cold. You just say I'm warm I'm warm I'm warm you'll be warmed you say all that but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body what does it profit faith without works is dead faith without works is dead you tell somebody I pray for you I bless you God bless you and all that but you don't open up your wallet that is faith without works how is our faith this morning then immediately somebody says no no brother that will become social gospel that is William Booth said soap soup salvation you know Salvation Army their slogan was soap soap salvation I don't think anything is wrong with it and if you say that it should not be soap soup salvation why don't you make salvation soap and soup anyway do it we need to help people we should not just help people just for preaching the gospel you know I have been in visiting mission fields for so many years and many of you would not have gone to some mission fields as I have gone I have witnessed some tribal villages some of the worst and the poorest parts of India I have literally lived there I have lived in some tribal hearts I know what poverty is coming to Chennai and coming to Delhi or coming to Bangalore and speaking about prosperity that's very easy you go to places where people do not have a next meal and we give a clothing to some poor tribal man to a poor tribal lady one sari we give her that's the only sari she has she goes to the pond in the village she becomes naked she she washes her sari she dries it and she's inside that water until that sari gets dried up 
And then she puts over, the, she closes the sari and she, with that sari clad, she comes home. And that is the only sari she uses until she comes to the next Christmas service where these missionaries will go and give her another set of dress. Because that's all a missionary organization can afford. I have lived in these places. I have seen these people. And these prosperity preachers don't go to those places. If they can go to those places, I will be happy with them. That's our responsibility. I know what it is. None of you are poor. We are all rich. And I am also very rich. I am very rich in India. You know why I say I am very rich in India? I have three full meals a day in India. I am very rich. Because 40% of my Indian brothers and sisters do not have one full meal a day. Do you know that? So if as an Indian I have three full meals a day, I am a rich guy. If God has given you more than what you need, it is in order that you may share it with those who are in need. Write it down. Write it down. If God has given you more than what you need, it is in order that you may share it with those who are in need. Say that again. If God has given you more than what you need, it is in order that you may share it with those who are in need. You are not listening to a theoretician or a theologian this morning. During the last few minutes, I preached like a missionary. This is not what I have read in some mission biographies. It is what I have seen and witnessed. It is our responsibility to maximum to relieve the suffering and the poor. How much shall we give? Maybe if you have the habit of giving one tenth of your income to God for church activities, why don't you give another tithe for the poor? Is it asking for too much? How many of us will go without bread if you give another tithe? I know I'm disturbing you. How many of us will go without bread if you give another tithe and that tithe goes to the poor? I don't think any of us will go without bread. We still have much left. We still have much left. So it is necessary. That's why Jesus said, as you go, preach the gospel. He didn't put a full stop there. Minister to the sick. He didn't say heal the lepers. Did he say heal the lepers? He said cleanse the lepers. That is what Graham Staines was doing. In those jungle forest villages of Orissa, where he and his two sons were burnt alive. That horrible dark night of Indian history. He was cleansing the lepers, touching the oozing wounds, the smelly, stinking wounds of the lepers. It's easy for you to come from India to America, but it's very difficult for an Australian to come to India and that to go to a stage like Orissa. My wife and I, we lived in Orissa for three full years. You know what it is. The tribal state of our country. He was cleansing the lepers, wiping, washing their wounds. Several of them had disfigured bodies. He was working among them. Great would be his reward in heaven. His two sons were promoted much more than their contemporaries. We had the privilege of meeting with uh, Mrs. Graham Staines. And this is what she said. They have gone to the reward. And I want to run my race. Where are we? We are reading the Bible. We are studying the Bible. But how about our faith? I'm just calling you this morning to have your faith in action. Faith without works. Faith with corresponding activities is dead. Christ is not only the savior of our soul, he is the savior of our body also. Seventhly and lastly. You have to balance between churches and missions. Churches and missions. Churches and evangelistic missionary organizations. I think God has uh, kept both these with a good purpose. Churches and missions should not think of each other as a competitive. They are actually not competitive, they are complementary. The missions and missionary organizations are like the extension of the arms of the church. A local church cannot translate the Bible. A local church cannot train and uh, plant and supervise missionaries in a remotest tribal area. These are our specialized ministries. And God has raised several ministries. A, a, a local church cannot uh, produce Bibles. 
They can interpret Bibles, but they cannot translate and print Bibles. So God has raised several missionary organizations, an evangelistic organizations, which we call para-church organizations. Para. Para means parallel. The Holy Spirit is called paraclete. That means he is parallel to the first comforter. Para. He goes parallelly. So they are not able to comp compete with each other, but complement each other. Now I have been privileged to be a part of a parachute organization. And I always told the parachute organization, we do not exist for ourselves, we exist for the church. If the church is the building, the parachute organizations are the scaffolding. You can't build a building without scaffolding. The church is not completed, the construction is still going on. And God in His grace and mercy has raised so many organizations all across the globe to extend a helping hand for the church to grow and come to its fullness. You know, I often used to think about, you know, you take your uh, forearm, you try to just bend uh, there. When you bend your uh, forearm, you know what happens? The, the uh, muscle underneath, it goes through tension. But the muscle that is on the top, you know, that biceps that go through a compression. And vice versa. Now, the parasite organizations keep on saying, go, go, go. But the pastor and the local church will always say, come, 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 come to the meeting. So there will be a tension. One says, go, the other says, come. But I don't think it is a competition. It is a complementation. Unless there is tension and compression, you are going to move. That's what I call operation in cooperation. You know, we need to come to that kind of understanding and should not think of one as a threat to the other. We need to keep both in proper balance. Maybe this may not be relevant to all of you sitting here, but those of you in leadership, you'll understand how God has kept one for the help of the other. We need to learn from one another. We cannot be independent of one another. Now, in conclusion, I would like to make a comment. When I say balance, I am not talking about neutrality. <laughs> when I talk balance, I don't refer to neutrality. You know, balance in Tamil means sama nilai. Neutrality in Tamil means sama rasam. In neutrality, you never go anywhere, I told you earlier. It's not taking the middle of the position, but it is bringing both the extremes together and working with a healthy tension. I want all of you to stand up. Opening up your Bibles to a tremendous promise which I have been holding on in my life, in my study, and in my ministry. And I want every one of you to claim that promise in your life. Open up your Bibles to book of Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 21. Beautiful words. A verse where God has promised His guidance of balance. Isaiah 30 and verse 21. First, I will read that verse for you. Then I would all, I'll request all of you together to read and claim that promise for your life, for your family, for your church, for your ministry, for your society, for your community, for your work spot, wherever God will.